Hi, it's me, Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut. Welcome to the 2021 Astro Awards. This is where we look back and reflect on all the exciting things that happened throughout the year in space flight and space science. This year was literally the most jam-packed year for orbital missions, and boy oh boy, do we have a lot of awesome stuff to celebrate. So without further ado, may I present to you the 2021 Astro Awards. <laughs> Hello and good evening, everyone. Welcome to the fifth annual Astro Awards. Each year, we pick our favorite space moments and award the winner the much coveted Astro Award. <laughs> now, as you guys know, this obviously isn't just some thing I found on eBay. It's a very famous and coveted award. And, you know, our participants are fortunate to even look at it, frankly. The Astro Awards is our chance as the general public to lift up, celebrate, and thank those who dedicate their lives to furthering our knowledge and understanding of not only the world we live on, but who also help discover our place amongst the stars. For this, we do some ranked choice voting amongst patrons and YouTube members, and we also do a poll for the top slots on Twitter. So thank you to those of you who gave us your feedback. But when all is said and done, I take your feedback and I consider it, but I end up just personally choosing the final order because, well, this is my YouTube channel. So <laughs> I put weight not only on scientific significance, but also just cultural impact and just whatever made me happy in the last year. At the end of the day, this is purely meant to be just something that we celebrate fun stuff. So don't be too upset if the mission you thought was most important or deserving isn't in the place where you thought it should be on our list. Really don't take the order too seriously. Okay, here's some fun notes about spaceflight in 2021. We saw the most orbital launches in one year ever at 146 launch attempts, of which 134 were successful, a record held since 1967. That's unbelievable. And the success rate was even higher than it was back then too. And consider how many of the failures were from new launch companies. So yeah, it's getting pretty good. We also saw more human launches than ever and had more people above the Kármán line at one time than ever before, with 19 people technically in space at the same time. There were 10 humans on board the ISS, three Taikonauts on board the Tiangong space station, and six humans were above the Kármán line on board New Shepard 19 for a brief moment, all on December 11th. It's gonna be really funny to look back at this someday and be like, remember when we thought 19 was a lot of people? I can't wait until it's like hundreds and we're like losing track of how many people were in space at one time. Another spaceflight milestone that isn't deserving of an award or honorable mentions includes something we all thought would never happen. Something so impossible, the Vegas odds of completion were like one in one million. Something seemingly decades in the making. Of course, I'm talking about the Soviet rocket engine video. <laughs> yes, that's right. After two years of research and over five months of shooting and editing and animations and everything, we finally posted our one hour and 33 minute deep dive on the entire history of the Soviet rocket engine family tree. I do promise it's worth the watch. There's tons of just really fun stories in that video, lots of cool B-roll and awesome renders and tons of stats and cool animations. So yeah, I'm really glad that that's finally out so I can get back to making easier to make videos and like this. In fact, we even have another video literally done in the queue. So maybe that could be what I try and do in 2022 is like, you know, shoot some videos and actually have like a stockpile and roll them out gradually so you don't have to wait five months between videos. There's an idea. Next, before we get into the awards, let's take a few moments to reflect and remember some great people who made an impact in space history. those of you who lost loved ones this year, our sincere thoughts and prayers are with you, but their legacies still live on. And I just wanted to give a quick little extra mention to the tragedy of losing Glenn DeVries this year. 
He was very active in the spaceflight community and had just flown to space on New Shepard NS-18 before he tragically died in a small plane crash less than a month later at the age of 49. Okay, time for some honorable mentions. We saw the stacking of two brand new super heavy lift launch vehicles for the first time in 2021. Both SpaceX's Starship and NASA's SLS stood at their complete height, marking an exciting milestone as we prepare for a new era of super heavy lift launchers. Although neither rockets made it off the pad this year, just seeing the progress of these two vehicles is noteworthy. What an exciting time to be alive, where two brand new super heavy lift vehicles are racing to be the first to orbit. Next, I wanted to give a shout out to Firefly for their first orbital launch attempt of their Alpha launch vehicle. Mostly because they set a launch date months in advance and they lifted off right in the middle of their very first launch window on the very first day. That's hard to do for even the most experienced launch providers, let alone a first launch attempt ever. The rocket had a nice clean liftoff, but unfortunately an engine shut down prematurely just a few seconds into flight, resulting in the loss of the vehicle a minute or so later. I have a lot of confidence in their next launch attempt and I can't wait to see them try again. It was a truly impressive first try and featured not only a trench camera, but even an engine cam during the live stream. How cool is that? NASA made progress on their Artemis program, having down-selected from three lunar lander options to choosing Starship as the sole lunar lander for the Artemis program, something I did not see coming. After some protests and lawsuits from the national team led by Blue Origin and the Dynetics teams, NASA pushed through to finalize Starship as the one and only lander for now. So yes, in the future, we should see the development of the lunar lander variant of Starship, and that means we might see a 15-ish story tall rocket on the surface of the moon. Yes, that's absolutely crazy. This year, we also saw the completion of the Russian side of the ISS when they docked both the Nauka and the Prachal modules to the ISS after having undocked and retired the Piers module. This is just an honorable mention because the missions were about 14 years late and they endangered the ISS when the Nauka module docked and fired a thruster, which caused the ISS to tumble out of control for one and a half full rotations. All is good now, but the cool thing now is that the ISS actually has a lot more docking capabilities than ever with the new Prachal module, and it adds functionality of a new robotic arm from ESA as well. And lastly, we saw a trio of awesome science missions launched by NASA right at the end of the year. First, we saw the Lucy spacecraft launch on an Atlas V 401 on a 12 year journey to eight different asteroids, seven of which are within Jupiter's orbit, which will be really cool to explore. Then we saw SpaceX launch the Double Asteroid Redirect Test, or DART, on a Falcon 9 on November 24th. This is an exciting mission testing out a method of planetary defense against near-Earth objects by intentionally crashing into an asteroid and measuring its change in velocity. It was originally intended to just be flown as part of a GTO rideshare mission, but SpaceX's Falcon 9 was so cheap, a dedicated ride ended up being the cheapest option. Lastly, there is the Imaging X-ray Polarimetry Explorer, or XP, which is a trio of X-ray telescopes on a single satellite to measure the polarization of cosmic X-rays, which was launched on a Falcon 9. It was the lightest dedicated payload a Falcon 9 has ever launched at just 330 kilograms. It was originally designed to be flown on a Pegasus small sat rocket, but it turns out the cheapest ride to its equatorial orbit wound up being a dedicated Falcon 9. That's crazy. Okay, that's the honorable mentions for this year, but let's keep a close eye on those for the future because I have a feeling we'll be handing out a few Astro Awards based on the progress of a lot of those here pretty soon. Speaking of the Falcon 9 beating out rideshare or small sat launchers for dedicated rides, our first Astro Award goes to SpaceX for their Falcon 9 hitting some impressive milestones. And normally this would only be an honorable mention, but one little feat pushed me over the edge. The Falcon 9 team knocked it out of the park this year with 31 launches on just 10 boosters, meaning they averaged 3.1 flights per booster this year. They landed 30 out of the 31 flights. Booster 1060 was used six times in just 329 days, averaging only a 65 day turnaround time. 
SpaceX broke their launch turnaround record twice this year at one day, 20 hours and seven minutes, and then again, down to just 15 hours and 17 minutes between launches. Now, of course, this was on different launch pads. The fastest they reflew a booster dropped in half from 51 to just 27 days. Over half the flights used flight proven fairing halves as well, and they recovered 86% of their fairing halves. They even flew fairings for the fourth and fifth time this year. But it isn't the fact that it did better than the year before, or put up more launch mass than every other rocket combined basically, or any of the other things that we were excited about last year with the Falcon 9 and just like updated it for this year. The thing that pushed the Falcon 9 into Astro Award territory was the fact that they beat their own internal design goal. The Falcon 9 Block 5 was designed for 10 flights with minimal refurbishments. Minimal meaning just kind of clean the engines out, do some checks here and there, replace a few minor components maybe, and send her back out to the launch pad. And this year, B-1051 not only reached 10 flights, but wound up hitting an 11th flight on just that one booster. Now, it might have looked like there was a long period of time between the 10th and the 11th flight of that booster, perhaps long enough for some major refurbishments, but that wasn't the case. The holdup wasn't the rocket, it was the next generation of Starlink satellites that held the rocket up. SpaceX has truly outdone themselves with the Falcon 9, and I hate that I had to give it an award to a rocket that seems to get an award every single year. And honestly, I hate sounding like a huge SpaceX fanboy, but if we aren't celebrating the best of the best, then what's the point? So congratulations to the teams at SpaceX for continuing to push the boundaries of commercial spaceflight, breaking internal goals, and continuing to prove yourselves right with reusability and your awesome Falcon 9. I can't wait to see what next year brings for the Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy. And hopefully in 2022, we get our brand new Falcon 9 model rockets. They are going to be awesome, super high detailed, high quality, strong and not fragile. They're made out of metal. These are going to look awesome. And hopefully we have these out here in the next month or two. So stay tuned. 2021 saw the launch of a brand new space station. China launched the Tiangong Space Station on April 29th, 2021. Not to be confused with Tiangong 1 or Tiangong 2, this is a very large new space station, roughly the size of Roscosmos's former Mir station. The exciting thing about the station is that it's modular, much like the ISS, and China has awesome plans to grow it quite a bit and really quickly. With over 1,000 experiments approved by CNSA, there will hopefully be a good amount of science to come from the station. But maybe the coolest thing about the Tiangong space station is that it has both chemical thrusters as well as ion thrusters. So for the first time in history, humans are being pushed around in space via ion thrusters. Although there wasn't some big technological breakthrough that prevented us from doing this in the past, it's still a really cool feature for a space station that allows it to maintain orbit much more efficiently. Ion thrusters typically aren't used on crewed vehicles because their thrust is so low it would take far too long to get to the destination. But maintaining an orbit is the perfect application for ion propulsion. This same technology is also planned for the Lunar Gateway as well, which totally makes sense. So far, there's already been two docking resupply missions, which were autonomous, two crewed missions, as well as a handful of EVAs. Tiangong Space Station has been very busy. So far, the crewed missions have been using the Shenzhou spacecraft, which is kind of like a bigger Soyuz spacecraft and is loosely based on its design. But China will hopefully be using their next generation spacecraft soon, which would be a major upgrade. So congratulations to CNSA and those involved in the program so far. Now please start properly deorbiting your core stages of the Long March 5B, and maybe you'll be higher up on our list next year. 2021 saw the successful launch of two new SmallSat launchers making it to orbit this year. The first of these new SmallSat launchers with a clean sheet design was Virgin Orbit with their awesome Launcher 1 air launched SmallSat launcher. Sporting an impressive 300 kilograms to sun synchronous orbit and the ability to launch to any inclination from any destination and in basically any weather condition thanks to its air launch system, it's truly a unique player in the SmallSat launcher game. 
On only their second launch attempt, on January 17th, they officially reached orbit carrying 10 NASA-sponsored CubeSats, also making them the first liquid-fueled air-launched rocket to reach orbit. They launched again on June 30th for a mission called Tubular Bells, carrying four military CubeSats, providing they're truly operational and ready to keep moving forward. With around a dozen or so scheduled upcoming launches, they're gonna be a fun company to watch grow. But they weren't the only small sat launcher to reach orbit this year. Astra also made it to orbit on their fourth orbital launch attempt of their launch vehicle on November 20th. After almost reaching orbit in 2020, they had one other launch attempt in August of 2021, which was maybe one of the most entertaining and wild starts to a launch ever when the rocket power slided off the launch pad because an engine shut down at liftoff. They obviously figured out the issue and fixed it in a hurry because less than three months later, they had a perfect launch of SCP-27 AD-2. Astra is looking to continue to pick up their launch cadence with several launches planned in the next few months already. If you wanna know more about how these rockets compare not only to each other, but also to other upcoming launchers and the OG new space rocket, the Falcon 1, be sure and watch my video, The King of Small Sat Launchers, where we compare all of them head to head. But huge congrats to the teams at Virgin Orbit for knocking it out of the park on just your second attempt ever. And also to the teams at Astra for continually honing in and finally nailing a successful orbital mission. I can't wait to see what the future holds for both of these companies. This one was a fan favorite and frankly, a me favorite too. SN15 really is maybe on the upper end of the cool and fun to witness things ever list, but relatively low on the scientific significance and long-term importance list. Now, of course, we're talking about SpaceX successfully landing their SN15 prototype and recovering it. In order to understand why this is super awesome, but also not that significant in the grand scheme of things, Let's first look back at the Starship belly flop tests. SpaceX was launching their 50 meter tall, nine meter wide behemoth Starship upper stage prototypes to 10 kilometers ish, and then letting them fall out of the sky belly first, only to try and light their engines at basically the very last moment, attempting to land them vertically using their engines. I'm not going to get into why they're doing this belly flop maneuver because I've already got a deep, deep, deep dive on everything belly flop, including why it's so late, what gravity losses are, what terminal velocity is, et cetera, et cetera. So watch my Why This Starship Belly Flop video if you want to learn more. After SN8, SN9, SN10, and SN11, on May 5th, 2021, SpaceX launched SN15 to approximately 10 kilometers and attempted another daring belly flop. Only this time, they absolutely stuck the landing despite having lost an engine on ascent and having utilized an off nominal landing profile. A big reason for the successful test was SpaceX's ability to very rapidly iterate between prototypes. Not only that, they have the production means to make it so a failure of these giant machines wasn't really that big of a deal. Now that it's been proven, the torch has been passed on to the next milestone, an all up Starship and super heavy orbital-ish launch attempt. And that, my friends, will be absurd. When that thing takes off, it'll be the world's heaviest, tallest, and most powerful rocket to ever fly, ever. Dethroning the powerful N1, which never made it all the way through its first stage burn on all four of its launch attempts, and it'll be even more capable than the Saturn V in terms of payload capacity. But SN15 and the whole belly flop program does need recognition for helping to drum up public excitement more than ever before. To almost obnoxious levels of obsession and hardware stalking by the community. But this stuff matters. Watching a company go all in on something this ambitious, this ridiculous, and do so this publicly really is inspiring. I personally know of several people who have literally stopped what they're doing, then driven down to Starbase at just the chance to work on something this ambitious and inspiring. I don't think I can really say that about any other project, at least in my lifetime. But at the end of the day, the belly flop tests weren't of any real long-term significance and will go down in history, much like SpaceX's Grasshopper or the F9R tests. They were awesome and important, but they're kind of just a small blip in SpaceX's history. So huge congratulations to the teams at SpaceX for making us ruin our TVs by burning in the logos and graphics from NASA Spaceflight and Lab Padre while watching every single second of development from this exciting program. Oh, and congrats on landing a big giant metal rocket in a way that very few would dare to try. 
2021 was the year of space tourism. Not only with suborbital trips to space becoming a reality, but also with a handful of exciting orbital missions as well. Let's just go in order here. The first milestone for space tourism was the first successful launch of a fully loaded Spaceship 2 space plane by Virgin Galactic. Now, technically, neither of the two flights Virgin had in 2021 were with space tourists, since all crew members were Virgin Galactic staff, but it was still a huge milestone to fly your CEO on your rocket plane to the edge of space. Hopefully we see more regular flights from them in 2022 with paying customers. Although we do have to await the results of an ongoing FAA investigation that hopefully only makes the vehicle more safe going forward. But just nine days after the successful launch of Richard Branson, Blue Origin's 16th launch of their new Shepard rocket would see their first humans on board. And boy, oh boy, was the pressure on. Not only did their first crewed flight have a paying customer, it also had aviation legend Wally Funk and their founder Jeff Bezos along with his brother Mark on board. New Shepard flights started picking up the pace with two more successful crew flights and they had their first flight with a full capsule of six people on NS-19 in December. We should give huge props to these companies for pushing the boundaries of spaceflight. I know some poke fun at the suborbital aspect and flame wars have started over whether or not participants are astronauts but the fact is Humans have an option for a service that was not an option ever in the past. Despite the prices being kind of unknown for likely around or under a million dollars, humans can now see Earth from incredible heights, over 10 times higher than a jetliner. And dang it, even if that only lasts for a few minutes, it's really, really cool. Okay, sure, maybe suborbit isn't good enough for you. Well, this year we saw several orbital space tourist missions too. Russia sent up two private missions to the ISS this year. The first was MS-19, when actress Yulia Persild and director Klim Shepenko flew on a Soyuz capsule and spent about 12 days filming on board the ISS before returning to Earth on the MS-18 Soyuz. The film is a joint project between Roscosmos, Russia's Channel One, and the Yellow, Black, and White studio. It's pretty cool that a feature-length film literally filmed scenes in space. I mean, how crazy is that? But Russia also sent up two more private citizens to the ISS in December, when Yusaku Maezawa and Yozo Hirano flew to the ISS for 12 days on board a Soyuz for MS-20. Now you might recognize the name Yusaku Maezawa as he's the Japanese entrepreneur who also purchased the first commercial ride on Starship around the moon for his Dear Moon project. Yusaku and Yozu shot a ton of really fun content while on the ISS. I know there's been a handful of astronauts who have made fun YouTube videos on the ISS, but there's a particular lightheartedness and genuineness about his YouTube videos. I highly recommend watching them. They're super fun, funny, and chances are you'll learn something too just by watching them. So a huge congratulations to the teams at Virgin Galactic, Blue Origin, Roscosmos, and Space Adventures for making space tourism more of a reality than ever, opening new doors and inspiring new markets for an exciting future in spaceflight. But you may notice, one space tourist mission was left out of this one. Well, stay tuned because we have a little more to dive into with that one. As impossible as it sounds, the sun has officially been touched by a spacecraft. And this is a huge scientific achievement. For those of you keeping track at home, Yes, we already awarded the Parker Solar Probe team an Astro Award in 2018 when it successfully launched, and it also ended up reaching a low altitude record around the sun by the end of that year. But since its launch, it's done five flybys of Venus, which give it a healthy gravitational assist, lowering its orbit around the sun each time. So although we're really just kind of celebrating a lower altitude record, there is some real significance here. On April 28th, at the lowest point or perihelion of its eighth orbit, it officially entered the sun's corona for the first time. And it survived. Just think about that. NASA flew a spacecraft into the upper atmosphere of the sun and it didn't melt. I mean, that's just amazing. Technically, the spacecraft crossed what's known as the Alvin critical surface, which is a point where the sun's gravity and magnetic fields are too weak to hold the solar material. So up until actually crossing it, scientists couldn't precisely determine where this point actually was. And what's cool is scientists already realize the point isn't just some smooth circle around the sun. Instead, it's kind of zigzaggy and jagged, and the spacecraft saw large fluctuations in the magnetic field as it flew along. 
You can really only observe and take measurements of the magnetic field and plasma up close and personal. And that's precisely what Parker Solar Probe has been able to do. In 2019, teams observed what's known as switchbacks in the solar wind. And already just two years later, thanks to passing within the corona, they've now discovered the origin of these switchbacks. Scientists have already learned a ton from these flybys, with the probe having done two more passes at even lower altitudes, with the latest flyby on November 21st, reaching a new perihelion altitude record of just 6.1 million kilometers which results in a new velocity record for a human-made object at 163 kilometers per second, or about 22 times faster than something that's in low Earth orbit. Although that's still only about 0.05% the speed of light. As exciting as these altitude records and initial observations are, the knowledge gained from these flybys will be impactful for years to come as scientists comb over the data and make new discoveries in the future. The spacecraft has an expected lifespan lasting until 2025 with 16 more orbits. So perhaps by the end of its mission, we'll make even more profound discoveries and observations. So congratulations to the teams at the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory and NASA for already learning more about not only our sun, but also each and every star in our universe. Wait, what? The launch of the James Webb Space Telescope isn't at the top of our list? This can't be right. I'm quitting and I'm unsubscribing and I'm sending you a bill for $23 for wasting my time. Well, first off, remember to not put too much weight or seriousness into the order of these things, but also... Remember how we awarded three honorable mentions for NASA missions that have so far only launched and have yet to really begin their missions? Well, <laughs> we're applying a healthy double standard here for even giving the launch of James Webb Space Telescope an Astro Award. Because celebrating the success of James Webb now before it overcomes all 344 potential single points of failure and five months of alignment and calibration before it can even begin its operation and bring us back data, is a bit premature, if you ask me. The good news is all deployments so far have gone off super smoothly as of the making of this video, but I'm still holding my breath as there's still a ton of work to be done. But we do need to celebrate the successful launch of the most advanced, ambitious, and downright incredible piece of space science machinery ever made. It finally launched, and it was absolutely flawless thanks to Ariane Space with their incredible Ariane 5. And when I say flawless, just look at this. With such a precise injection of James Webb to its destination, it means it can utilize more of its limited propellant for station keeping and regular guidance instead of wasting any of it to get to its proper destination. This translates to the potential to outlive its projected 10 year life. That's right, such an accurate ride may have added years to the lifespan of this coveted telescope. That right there is worthy of applause and push this launch up on our list closer to the top than originally planned. Now, I likely don't need to explain to you the significance of the James Webb Space Telescope, as the impact lately has been just amazing here at the end of 2021. It really has the potential to reshape our understanding of the universe and unlock secrets of nearby worlds like never before. So yeah, I broke the rules a little bit and I included it in our main list, deserving of an Astro Award and pretty close to the top because Ariane Space absolutely knocked this one out of the park. And with the most expensive payload ever launched riding on this rocket, it sure was a nail biter. This was a Christmas morning to remember. Watching James Webb Space Telescope lift off was surreal. So assuming the deployment is successful, James Webb Space Telescope bringing back clear images and valuable data next year is going to be really hard to beat. So congrats to the teams at Northrop Grumman, Ball Aerospace, L3 Harris, NASA, and the Canadian Space Agency for finally finishing up this beautiful piece of hardware. But a huge congratulations and a massive thank you is in order to ESA and Ariane Space for the flawless beginning of this incredible journey. You absolutely nailed it. Like I said, this was the year of space tourism. And 
Although this topic is strongly debated by both the public complaining about billionaires wasting money on joyrides to space, but also the spaceflight community arguing about whether or not spaceflight participants are astronauts. One mission went quite literally above and beyond and made a lot of history, as well as raised a lot of money for a good cause. Inspiration4 was really only put into motion at the end of 2020 by Jared Isaacman, an American businessman and pilot. Fun fact about Jared, at one point he owned the world's largest private air force as he was co-owner of Draken International. <laughs> it's kind of crazy. On February 1st, SpaceX announced Inspiration4 and shared what is perhaps one of the most generous giveaways of all time as Jared was to be giving away the other three seats of the Crew Dragon capsule to members of the general public. Let's stop and think about that for just a second. I'm not sure why this wasn't a bigger deal. If a seat on a Dragon cost NASA $55 million each, even if this mission was cheaper than a Dragon mission to the ISS, that's still likely a giveaway of up to like $50 million per seat. That's insane. As we know, Jared chose St. Jude research assistant and now SpaceX employee Haley Arsenault, data engineer Chris Sembrowski, and geology professor slash science communicator Sion Proctor to join him on this three-day mission to low Earth orbit. Let's start off with some firsts. This was the first all-civilian, non-professional orbital mission, and it was the highest humans have gone since the third, but not the last, Hubble servicing mission. STS-109 by reaching 585 kilometers in altitude. It was also the first orbital free flight with crew since the space shuttle, as well as the first Dragon capsule to replace its docking port with a massive cupola window, which offered incredible views. But none of these things would really make this mission all that noteworthy, or anywhere near the top of our list. It'd likely just be lumped into the rest of the spaceflight tourist missions. But this was much more than a spaceflight tourist mission. This was also one of the largest fundraisers ever, raising around $240 million for St. Jude Children's Hospital. If you don't understand why all of this is important and why this is so impactful, I really think you should watch the Inspiration4 documentary Countdown on Netflix. It honestly puts this whole thing into a far better perspective than I possibly could in a short period of time. But to me, this was a real friendly reminder to just simply dream. Because four everyday humans just casually got on top of a rocket and went to space and saw our planet from a perspective that previously would have been absolutely impossible if you weren't hand selected by a government agency. Three of these humans were given this opportunity by the generosity of another human. That's a thing you can do now. You can literally pay for a friend, family member, or a complete stranger to go to space if you're wealthy enough. I know it was only a three-day mission to an altitude only about 50% higher than the ISS, but we'll definitely look back at this moment and think about what kind of doors this opened up. We'll remember when someone had a wild enough idea to try and raise money for a children's hospital by using the publicity of a mission to space. So huge congratulations to the teams at SpaceX for putting this mission together in less than a year and absolutely knocking it out of the park. In fact, they even launched in Q3 despite the press release saying it'd be no earlier than Q4. A spaceflight event moved left? <laughs> What is that? Is that even possible? But an even bigger congratulations to Haley, Chris, Cyan, and Jared for not just doing something incredible, but for bringing us along with you, representing us, and helping us dream about doing something only recently thought impossible. But most importantly, for raising $240 million for St. Jude Children's Hospital. Now that is definitely something to celebrate. Last year, we handed out a set of awards for three flawless launches to Mars, and at the beginning of 2021, we saw three absolutely textbook Mars missions begin. Now, normally, I probably would have separated all these out and tried to give some level of different importance to each mission. But honestly, all three of these missions deserve a spot at the top of our list, but one of them went literally above and beyond. 
starting with the Hope Al Amal mission, which arrived at Mars on February 9th with an orbital insertion burn of about 27 minutes. Now in its planned highly elliptical Mars orbit, the spacecraft is paying close attention to Mars' atmosphere, especially throughout different seasons. This deserves a spot this high up because it was United Arab Emirates' first interplanetary mission and it's been executed flawlessly. We also saw China do a Mars hat trick with an orbiter, a lander, and a rover, all make it to Mars successfully in just one mission. Oh wait, and it also took with it an intergalactic selfie stick of sorts with a separate tiny camera satellite they ejected from the main satellites to take pictures on its journey towards Mars. But China not only successfully put Tianwen into orbit, they also did something only the United States and the Soviet Union had done successfully, softly touch down on Mars. They then deployed a small rover, making them only the second country after the United States to drive a robotic rover on the surface of Mars. All three vehicles made it past their initial three month life expectancy, survived a 50 day offline period and are back to collecting data. This is all super impressive for a country's first real try at the red planet having only an unsuccessful joint mission to Mars with Russia in 2011. So this was an all home-baked mission utilizing a Chinese launch vehicle, spacecrafts, and mission control. Considering even mighty Russia and the Soviet Union prior hadn't even been this successful in exploring Mars, this is truly deserving to be on the top of our list. But perhaps due to a bit of good old fashioned America bias, one mission stands out amongst the others. NASA's Mars 2020 mission featuring the Perseverance rover would be as textbook perfect of a Mars missions as you could possibly dream up. But this isn't just Curiosity 2.0, and don't just take my word for it. Check out my video comparing the two so you can <laughs> take my word for it, <laughs> I guess. Hmm. Okay, but here's why this is even better than Curiosity. First off, this mission brought back the absolute best video of entry, descent, and landing we've ever seen. NASA knocked it out of the park by cramming tons of cameras and microphones on this vehicle so they could really help take us to the surface of Mars. Then the Mars Environmental Dynamics Analyzer recorded the first weather report on Mars. Then Perseverance generated 5.37 grams of oxygen utilizing the MOXIE ISRU experiment, which is a huge deal. Perseverance has also been collecting and caching soil samples into tubes. Now this is vital for preserving Mars's conditions before we continue to potentially contaminate it with future rovers or potentially even human missions. These samples are planned to be collected and picked up by a future mission led by ESA, where they'll be loaded onto a tiny little rocket and eventually shot back to Earth, hopefully bringing back Martian soil, likely for the first time. Okay, again, all of this is great, but here's why the Mars 2020 mission deserves to be at the absolute tippy top of our list, at least in my opinion. There's a little cherry on top, or perhaps I should say uh, on the bottom of Perseverance that makes this mission extra incredible. Less than two months after landing on Mars, the teams at NASA and JPL commanded the rover to deploy ingenuity from the belly of Perseverance. And with that command, we had the first vehicle capable of flying around on another planet. In other words, NASA landed a helicopter on Mars. And beyond that, they flew it a lot with great success. And this, this success is what makes this mission extraordinary. Flying a helicopter, or more pedantically, a multi-rotor demonstrator on Mars is maybe the top of the cool and awesome list, but it frankly has relatively little direct scientific data since the only instruments on board are cameras. But there are some serious hurdles to flying a vehicle on Mars. Being able to fly in an atmosphere that's only about 1% that of Earth's requires super lightweight materials and massive rotors that can spin extremely fast in order to produce the necessary lift. To date, it's flown 18 times, beyond its initial goal of five times. It's flown for a total of 32 minutes and 51 seconds, all autonomously from over hundreds of millions of kilometers from Earth. And that's just simply amazing. Now, since there aren't any trees or power lines or buildings or really any other obstacles to avoid besides the relative terrain, 
Ingenuity can cover a lot of distance in a much shorter period of time than any rover ever could. It's already covered 3.82 kilometers compared to the 2.83 kilometers that Perseverance has covered, despite Ingenuity's mission so far being much shorter duration. The implications are someday we could really explore huge areas of Mars without slowly crawling along, trying to not break the precious metal wheels of our rovers, or having to avoid hills or bumps or cracks or whatever. Just fly around and explore. This also sets a good example for future interplanetary missions such as Dragonfly, which plans to fly around on Saturn's moon, Titan. I just love that this mission, in typical JPL fashion, far outperformed its planned lifespan and has been a shining example of pushing the boundaries. So huge congratulations to everyone now exploring Mars on behalf of humanity. Congrats to the teams at the Mohammed bin Rashid Space Center for the success of the Hope Al Amal probe. Congrats to the Chinese National Space Administration for the huge success of Tianwen. And congrats to JPL and NASA for not only a fine rover and mission with Perseverance, but also exploring Mars like never before with ingenuity. 2021 was jam-packed, full of absolutely incredible spaceflight events. And I feel like the community as a whole grew even more this year. And to me, that's really what this is all about. It's not just about pushing the boundaries, making scientific discoveries, or standing on new worlds. It's about uniting us under a common bond of exploration and excitement. There's a feedback loop in play here, and I hope you all understand your role in it. By tuning into these events, by cheering for the scientists and the engineers who make this all possible, you are helping foster and create an environment for future generations to want to take part in. To those of you parents who have kids at your side as you catch up on space news, or to those teachers who stop their usual lessons to witness spaceflight history, or even to those of you who have traveled vast distances to witness a launch in person, you are making the difference. I can't even begin to tell you how many people I've met that have changed their career paths and are now literally building rockets or developing spacecrafts or doing planetary science all because they happened to catch the bug. This is what truly propels us into the future. A society excited about the next step, eager to work on something historic and meaningful, and a growing workforce who has been inspired by others to do great things. And that, my friends, is what the Astro Awards are all about. Cheering on those who make this all possible. The engineers and scientists who inspire each and every one of us, who loses sleep over their projects, who dream big and teach us about our universe. And with that, thank you to all of you who are watching this. To those of you who have subscribed here and have been a part of this incredible community. For the encouragement, the patience, the love, and the support, it all really makes a difference, I promise. And an extra special thanks to our patrons and YouTube members. You all have helped me pursue things that I would have never thought were possible, such as a dedicated studio space just eight kilometers from where Starship launches, or dedicating five plus whole months to shooting and editing my most comprehensive and hardest to make video ever. So if you want to support what we do here at Everyday Astronaut, consider becoming a Patreon supporter, where you'll gain access to our exclusive Discord channel, lots of other live streams, and just tons of fun stuff over at patreon.com slash everydayastronaut. And while you're online, be sure and check out our new merchandise, such as this R7 shirt or the rest of our Soviet collection, or maybe our new RS-25 shirt or our space shuttle ejection hoodie, or some of our schematics collection or whatever else. There's lots of fun stuff for you or a loved one at everydayastronaut.com slash shop. Thanks everybody, that's gonna do it for me. I'm Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut, bringing space down to Earth for everyday people.